Okay, don't hit skip before we start today's podcast. I'm really excited. This is a personal, exciting thing for me. I wanted to quickly let you guys know about my upcoming Off the Vine tour called Poor Decisions. P-O-U-R, the wine will be drank. I'm back on the road for the first leg of our tour. I'm coming through the good old Midwest. For the second half, I'll be headed to the Southeast. So I'm going Columbus, Cleveland, Ohio, Atlanta, Madison, Des Moines, Kansas City, Columbia, Missouri, Tampa, Orlando, Nashville. Ah! I'm coming to all you beautiful people. These podcast tours are always a highlight of my year because there's just no other way to put it than it's just pretty damn fun. I get to hang out with you in person. It's just the energy is electric. I've It's, it's just insane. Like leaving those live podcasts, I'm like, whoa, that felt like an empowerment session. I feel elevated. The vibrations don't get me started on how high those are. So check out my website, caitlinbristow.com to buy tickets for those who join me. I can guarantee a little dancing, a lot of laughing, wine, Lots of wine. <laughs> uh, even if you're pregnant. I've had pregnant, sober people come to my show and say it was still fun. They bring their boyfriends, their husbands, and I even see them smiling at the end of it. So let's toast to that. I'll see you on tour. Off the vine. <laughs> hey, everybody. Welcome to Off the Vine. I'm your host, Caitlin Bristow. Today, I have a really real, honest fun conversation with Teddy Mellencamp. She shares her journey of being diagnosed with her 13th melanoma, things that we should be looking out for and preventative ways to take care of our skin. We talk about having a famous dad, John Mellencamp, what that looked like for her growing up in that kind of world, what she thinks about being a Nepo baby. And also we play a little fun game of two truths and a lie, which I find out a very interesting thing about Teddy. <laughs> Enjoy this episode. So first of all, good to see you. I feel like we, the last time we podcasted, I think was 2019 and that, I don't know about you, but I feel like everybody feels like there's a glitch in the matrix where the last four years were just like, it was just one year, but somehow four. And it feels like yesterday was 2019. Well, that's exactly how I felt. I was like, oh, I just did her pod. And then my post was like, no, that was four or five years. Like that was a long time ago. A long time ago. And I know we spoke about your fitness accountability business and filming the real housewives and your marriage, which I loved that episode. I actually went back and listened to see what we talked about before, but I want to learn more about you personally today and dive a little deeper and have like more of a sensitive conversation about what you've been going through the last two years with your skin cancer journey, because you've been incredibly open on social media. You actually encouraged me to go get all of my moles checked and start like looking into that because I was one of those people that in my, you know, late teens and early twenties, I was laying in a suntan bed trying to get that playboy bunny tan line on my lower abs. And uh, I didn't know any better. I, we would put stickers on ourselves to see yeah. the outline of like the two bunny ears. Like it was insanity. Well, and also our parents didn't know any better to not let us do that because they were the ones having tinfoil on their face <laughs> trying to get like leather skin. So it's like they didn't know any better either. And now we're starting to learn. So I love that you're open about it on social media because you were first diagnosed with stage two melanoma. And I think it was October, 2022, but what like sparked yeah. your, like what made you go get checked to take us back to that moment? So taking you kind of way back when I was born, I had like a, a white birthmark on my shoulder. That was like this, just like kind of a white circle that we never really thought it, we just assumed it was a birthmark. And then throughout the years, it got the more sun that I got, the frecklier it got. Like that all of a sudden that area became like this freckle patch. And I was like, oh, whatever. This is, I mean, I guess I was overlooking. It's sun damage, but it's fine, you know? Right. And then after I had my kids, my first two, the spots started to like get a little bit like rashy almost. And so I went to a dermatologist back then and they were like, oh, it's dermatitis or something like along those lines. And they put on like a hydrocortisone cream on it and it would go away and the spots would get big and small. And then that was kind of where we left it. Cut to, you know, right before I went in, I was on a run with Kyle Richards and I had just a sports bra on, of course. Got, yeah. I mean, why would I cover up my skin? And yeah. she's like, Teddy, the spots on your back, they look brutal. 
like something is askew you need to go i'm like i'm fine and she's like no from when you started filming beverly hills to now there's a huge difference you're going and i have severe anxiety uh, surrounding like doctor's appointments and things like that mm -hmm. which is odd considering i've had a neck lift but things that i can't control totally i'm with you i'm with you <laughs> So I was like, I'm not going. And she's like, actually, we're going right now. So we got back from the run. She texted her dermatologist and we went in and immediately they look at the area. There was one spot that seemed concerning to the doctor and of uh, to the dermatologist. And of course, she's like, do you want me just to do a little biopsy or do you want me to cut it out? And then we send in the whole thing. I'm like, just cut it out because I don't need to come back. In my mind, I was like, we'll just cut it out. We'll find out the information. That one came back stage two. And essentially, there wasn't clear margins. So then I started going back in. That's when I went to the oncologist. And throughout the next, essentially, 15 months, I kept being diagnosed with more. So I had over 13 melanomas. Wow. And they just, you know, the first one was the the highest stage. And then each one of them, we just kept catching quicker and quicker and quicker, but it was multiple surgeries. Sometimes I would go under, sometimes I would just be like, all right, I'll grin and bear it. Just give me the, the shots and then we can take them out. And then finally, after the last time I went to get checked, uh, the doctor was like, listen, your margins still aren't clear. There's still an issue. We've gone through, I did immunotherapy for six weeks, which made me feel terrible. And oh I, I couldn't eat. I felt nauseous. I didn't feel like myself. My skin blistered. Like it was not the best experience. And he was like, I don't want to keep cutting you bit by bit. So I'm going to do, I'm going to bring in another surgeon and we're going to do it. Like originally he said a skin grafting, but what they ended up doing is pulling my lower back uh, they cut a huge hole in my skin about this big and then they pulled like excess skin that I had from my lower back up over my shoulder. So that's why I have oh the thing God. that looks like Zorro or whatever it is on my back. And then now I'm just in a holding pattern and I go back in about three weeks to get checked again. I mean, let's talk about those emotions because for somebody that has anxiety around doctor's appointments and things that are out of your control, and also I feel like you're somebody that's such a go-getter. You're always busy. You're a mom of four. Like you're always going, doing to be kind of taken out like that and have anxiety around it. How did you even deal with that? I would say I kind of went like this. Like there was like that point of denial that I'm actually fine. This is not a big deal to what am I going to do? I'm, I, I could die too. Right. And then I, I became a, like, I would make my husband have conversations with me about, if I die, I want to pick out the kind of person that you're going to marry after me because oh I don't gosh, want, I, yeah, like, he's like, we're not talking about this. You're going to be fine. And I'm like, I know, but I don't trust your picker sometimes. So like, I, <laughs> I we're, we're going to have to talk about this. And I like texted my best friends about it. I'm like, listen, this is what I, this is my non-negotiables for Edwin's next wife. Like I need to make sure that she's, I don't care if she's hotter than me. None of that I care about. I want to make sure that she's funny and good with my kids and works hard and will show my kids a good worth work ethic. Everyone's like, Teddy, so you have lost I, re I really like, I was concerned. I was like, I don't want yeah. some girl to come in and be a disaster to my family. And th that's where my head was. And then I got declined for life insurance. So <gasps> if you don't have life insurance, get it now. Oh my gosh. You got declined. Why? Because I have skin cancer. So that's I tried to get it after the, yes, because clearly there's a chance that you're not going to make it. Oh my gosh. Wait, that is such a good learning lesson for all of us listening right now. Get life insurance. Yeah. Get life insurance. And like, I didn't have a will. I didn't have life insurance. I didn't have, cause I just was like that type of person. I'm going to be fine. I'm fine. You know, it doesn't, you know, life is good. I'm just going to keep on going. And then all of a sudden I was like, no, I have to figure these things out. Like I need a will, I need this, I need that. Yeah. Um, and then life insurance turned me down and I was like, wow, okay, this is more serious than I thought. And then it was just the highs and lows of thinking that it was gone and then it keep coming back that kind of just messed with my, my mental state a little bit. Off the Vine is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. 
Now let's face it, sometimes multitasking can be overwhelming. Like when your favorite podcast is playing, the person next to you is talking, your car fans blasting, all while you're just trying to find the perfect parking spot. But then again, sometimes multitasking is easy, like quoting with Progressive Insurance. They do all the hard work of comparing rates so you can find a great rate that works for you, even if it's not with them. Just give their nifty comparison tool a try and you might just find that getting the rate and coverage that you deserve is easy. Now all you need to do is visit Progressive's website to get a quote with all the coverages that you want, like comprehensive and collision coverage or personal injury protection, and then you'll see Progressive's direct rate and their tool will provide options from other companies all lined up and ready to compare so it's simple to choose the rate and coverages that you like. So press play on comparing auto rates, quote at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty and insurance company and affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations and prices vary based on how you buy. Okay, if you're anything like me, you've probably spent a few commercial breaks scrolling through house listings, envisioning your dream home. But guess what? I recently bought a house and let me tell you, Redfin was a game changer in the process. Redfin updates their listings every two minutes and sends you personalized recommendations. So finding the home that's perfect for you has never been easier. You see something you like, you can book a tour straight from the app. And when you're ready to buy an experienced local Redfin agent can guide you through the whole process. And also if you're looking to sell, Redfin agents know how to get you the best price possible for your home. And that's because they sell twice as many homes as other agents. So with the listing fee as low as 1%, Redfin's fees are half of what others often charge, which means that you'll have more money to put towards your next home. We love that. From finding my dream home to navigating the buying process, Redfin made it pretty much a breeze. And trust me, if you're in the market for a new place, download the Redfin app and get started today. You're a person that cares about, you know, wellness and health. How do you prioritize your mental health when you're going through such serious emotions? Well, I would say the worst it probably was. There there were two times that were really hard. The first time it was, I was actually at BravoCon, not this year, but the year prior. And I was told I was going to come back and have this little procedure done. And it was going to be done. And my husband, Edwin was being weird to me on the phone the whole time I was at BravoCon. And I was like, why is he being weird? You know, I just can read people's energy, not in a creepy way but like I could tell something was up but he was just kind of being like a little standoffish and so finally the day I leave the whole time it was in the back of my mind like why is my husband mad at me like why are we fighting like this seems so bananas Mm -hmm. and as I'm like okay I'm at the airport he's like your doctor called me because he knew this was a big week for you they're not going to be able to do the surgery because there's additional areas that came back as as lighting up so now you have to get your lymph nodes test and all these things and he goes i didn't want to he called me because he knew you were you know you were working but you're not having surgery when you get home tomorrow because they have to do additional testing and i was like lost it and i was just so upset because i thought something was going to happen that would fix it and it didn't so that was really hard and i still to this day i'm like i don't know edwin i think you could have told me day one like i think you probably could have let me know i probably could have handled it better than four days of additional stress thinking that we were like done for because you're such a bad liar but, and then the yes. second time was yeah you know what I mean like you're like yes. I'm like what did I do I always think about that because my mom always tries to protect me from certain things and she won't tell me but she'll treat me differently and I'm like I don't I but I go back and forth where I'm like I don't know if I'd want to know then when she should have told me or if I do appreciate that she waited because then it would have you know, ruined my trip or something. But in in this case, you're kind of like, I probably needed to know. Well, he also got really mad. There was a thing that like went viral online. It was not me. It was another girl that was fighting with somebody. It wasn't even at BravoCon, but everybody said, this is Teddy Mellencamp fighting with, I think it was Samantha Bush or something like that. And right. it was like a blonde girl, like punching another girl. And Edwin called me and he was like, what the hell is wrong with you? Like, Bob, like I... How can you do this right now? Like, why are you creating all this drama in your life? And I'm like, what are you talking about? That isn't me. It's a fake made up meme. And he he was just, he couldn't even laugh about it. And that's when I was like, what is going on? Clear. Have you ever seen me get into a physical altercation? You think I'm going to do it now at Bravo? Like, please. But it was all just like this pent up nervous energy he had. But I was like, babe, you should have just told me. But either way, that was a kind of a rocky time for me. And then the next time was after this last surgery because I had my surgery the day after Christmas. So it was like I had to get everything 
organized with the family. And I don't think I realized how big the surgery was, even though they told me a thousand times that I would be out and I needed to take six weeks to rest. But I went through like a little bit of depression afterwards because I'm so used to being on the go and I couldn't. For myself personally, I am also like, I like to go and I like to do, and I like to recharge my batteries, but in a certain way where it's like on my watch, like, okay, I'm I'm going to take Sunday to relax and watch TV and just like chill and eat McDonald's and whatever. But when um, I was really sick at the beginning of January and I couldn't get out of bed and I had a fever and I was doing all of this research into it because I was like, I feel really dark and really depressed and sickness actually mimics depression. So I can't even imagine going through what you're going through mentally, physically with a family, with your career, everything you've got going on and having to be just like scared. And I think a lot of times me personally, speaking from my own experience, when I'm scared, I try and mimic it in other emotions where I'm like irritable. I'm angry. I'm depressed when really I'm just scared. And it's just like so hard to to not just sit in that kind of depression because how could you not? And six weeks is such a long period of time for you to be out like that. And then, and then now just being in a holding period, like what do you do in the holding period? And is it just, is this something that's a lifelong journey for you that you'll have to always be up on? I I mean, I I think I have to get checked every three months from here on out just to make sure because clearly my body has the ability to for it to spread in in a quick way. But I think in regards to the emotional state, which is really what affects me more is I I also like when I get scared, I get a little like angry. Same. I'm just edgy. Like I can't take any sort of feedback. So, I mean, imagine also going through this and running a health and wellness company where you're breathing like positive energy and putting your best foot forward and all these things. And it it finally took one of my friends saying like, because I was getting, you know, to be perfectly honest, this whole whole Ozempic thing has made it tougher on my business because people are like, oh, I'll just take a shot. And I'm like, to each his own, you can take a shot. But the second you stop taking it, if you don't have a healthy lifestyle, all of the shot has done is going to wear off. So, you know, like my business was going through some changes. Somebody that works with me was like, and also one of my good friends, she was like, Teddy, you're going to need to show up. And I said, I can't show up. Mm. I can't not show up right now. Like I feel angry. I feel upset. It's all personal stuff, but I'm taking it out on my business. I would show up to the podcast and I'd be like, oh, I feel like I was faking it. Like everything didn't feel authentic. And then this is kind of bringing us to our next thing, which I know we were going to talk about the word of the year. Mm -hmm. My word of the year, I was told everybody was, was coping and everyone in my life is like, that doesn't sound like you. And I was like, but that's where I am. So take me or leave me. And my husband's like, you've never been like, I'm just going to cope. And I was like that I, I, I cannot specify to you more. And it finally took people like, pointing out some of the changes that I was making that had nothing to do with healing that was actually derailing my feeling better that I, I switched my word. Oh, okay. Cause I was like, well, that wasn't the word I thought you were going to say. Yeah. So it, it, yeah. you changed it. So co- yeah, because coping just feels like something that's survival mode that you had to do to get through. And it's so, I mean, it's so human of you to obviously feel dark and feel like you can't show up. Like there's, there's days where I suffer from hormonal depression where I can't show up. And so to be going through what you're going through, like, of course you don't, you feel like you're faking it. And, uh, and even if you have a health and wellness brand, like it's still honest for you to say that. And that's part of, you know, a health and wellness journey, in my opinion, is to, to go through like the ups and downs and just be honest about it. But when, how long did it take you to change your word from coping to the new one? It took about a, uh, another six weeks, I would say. I think I did a post the day it happened, but I, the beginning of the year, I sent an email. I mean, I sent a, I'm on a group text with all my coaches that are in my company because my friend John Gordon taught me about the word of the year because I'm very against like toxic positivity, but I do right. believe that you can manifest what it is that you, what you want in life. And I've always, he has such, you guys, if you haven't read any of John Gordon's books, they are incredible. And he's one of our dear friends and he coaches so many people through life, through business, through 
you know, a lot of different sports athletes. I mean, even when I said the word to him, he didn't, he didn't come in and be like, no, you can't say cope. He was like, okay, all right. You know, like you're feeling your feelings, blah, blah. I sent also to my coaches. I asked all of them what their word was. And then I said, I'm going to share mine. I'm probably in one of the darkest places I've been since I was in postpartum depression. And my word is cope. I hope it'll change. But right now, that's the only word I can think of. And then about six weeks later, I was like, I actually, you know what? I have a new mindset. I'm ready. And my word is strength. And I'm going to kick some ass this year. And I'm going to do things I've never done. And I don't know what that is going to be. But I have to give myself some hope to get my strength back. I love that because part of being strong is coping with certain things that you need to get through and certain emotions and letting those feelings come up and coping is part of being strong. Like that's something that I've worked on for the last 10 years in therapy. I never was taught any coping skills growing up. And so that's actually something that I have worked on. And that's part of my strength now is the coping skills that I've developed. So I love that you changed that word. And I do words of the year too. um, And I think it's just like, something that a little reminder every day, just one word that can mean so much. And what's your word this year? I can't pronounce it. How funny is that? Ah! (laughs) It's, I always get it wrong. It's basically it's reciprocation, but it's reciprocity. Thank you. I, uh, I can never (laughs) say it. And every time I try, I'm just like, I'm just going to say reciprocation because to me, I'm like, I want to surround myself who with people who feel the same way that I feel. I want it to be in my business, in my relationships, in my friendships, in everything that I'm doing. I just want to like be on the same, I don't know, like vibration as other people. And so okay. that was my word for the year. I mean, I have many other ones, but that was one where I was like, that's what I'm going to focus on. And I was, I was thinking about when you said, you know, you run this health wellness brand, have you incorporated like skincare and like kind of what you've been going through into part of taking care of your body? I haven't because I'm not like a licensed oncologist or dermatologist or anything like that. But when I was going through the darker stuff or when I was going through the the information about skin cancer, I have been very transparent on my social media. So like you can even go on to my Instagram, like Teddy Mellencamp, and you can go to like skin cancer or cure melanoma or whatever it is. And you can see all the different stages, things that I've learned, ways to incorporate, because something that people repeatedly were asking me, like they would send me pictures of their moles and then say like, could this be skin? And I was like, listen, mine didn't even look like a mole. Right. So... It can show up in any different form, but all I can tell all of you is go get your skin checked, find products that work for you that you'll actually use. But I, for a long time, I didn't put on sunscreen because I didn't like the way it felt on my skin. Hmm. Like I'd be like, ugh, I feel sticky. I'm like, I have textural issues, like all of it. And then I was like, this is so silly. Find the product that you actually really love. So for my face, I love Elemis. So like that is you know, or I like super goop, but it really, I'm not saying you have to use one of those products, but it's like anything. It's like working out. It's like whatever, what works for you that you're actually going to use? Because if you dread doing something, you're not going to do it. Right. And do you recommend like, I? so I wear 50 sunscreen on my face every day. I try and be smart about my, you know, being out in the sun and skin and everything. But do you, do you, like even on a winter day, let's say, do you recommend like just sunscreen every day? Like, are there things people can do to prevent? And also when you were saying that, I'm like, <laughs> from the beginning, when you said you had that white birthmark, I'm like, I have the same thing. And now I'm like, I'm oh. going to send her a picture and ask if I, and then I'm like, okay, <laughs> go, I'll just go to a doctor. <laughs> but do you have like advice, I guess, for listeners to either what to pay attention to or um, things that they can do to prevent? Well, I think... I mean, something I never really did, but layering, of course, you know, sunscreen is important, but even more so than that is like, I'm, whenever I'm out, I'm in hats. I have like, I'm, I'm going to go ride horses right after this. So like, I have this shirt, I have another shirt that goes over it. So I'm constantly where, when I was younger, I would wear like those Abercrombie and Fitch, like tank tops and like bake my, you know, so it's, it's keeping your skin covered. I remember when I was younger, I'd say, oh, I'm going to get that first burn and then it's going to peel off. And then, you know, then I'm going to get the tan. Yep. So it, it's it's mainly that and also just getting your skin checked. Like book that appointment. Like there's got to be between that and getting, you know, your your boobs checked. Like all of those things you have, yeah. those are yearly appointments. And if you're 
if you're staying on that, then your doctor will tell you what you need to be doing. Um, but not getting checked is not the answer. I've had to work on that where I'm kind of the same way as you as getting like nervous around doctor's appointments and like getting a mammogram. I just got one a few months ago and I was always just so like scared to find out anything. I was, I was kind of one of those, like yeah. what I don't know can't hurt me. And right. then you just go and you're like, the, the only regret anyone would ever have going is like, why didn't I do this earlier? And it's, it's over with quick. And it's like, just, it's to take care of yourself. And it just, I don't know, it's, it's a whole new perspective on health and self care, you know, because we all think in doing our skincare routine, working out, but part of getting older and even just in life is, is taking things like your, your body and your health seriously and getting checked because you can catch things like this before they happen, you know? So it's, yeah, it's just, it's just being proactive. And most of the time we don't do it because we don't want to fill out the paperwork to go get to like, I know that's, I'm like, ugh. now I'm going to have to money. click through all this shit and, and all of it. But it's, it's one of those things. Like you just, what you don't know can't hurt you until it really does. Okay. Taking Ozempic, but still need some guidance with your meals and workouts. Don't want to jump on the semaglutide train and looking for the best way to get in shape. Either way, accountability can help. And that's where all in by Teddy comes through. So do you want to get stronger? Try their new strength training program. Want to start running? Go with their finish line program. Or maybe you just want some good old fashioned accountability. The all in signature two week jumpstart will get your goals in check. But no matter what you're looking for, all in has got it. And when you use code off the vine, you'll get $50 off any program. Listen, we all have a different take on what health and wellness looks like. And that's why All In has been able to change over 30,000 lives. So go all in on yourself now at allinbyteddy.com and use code off the vine to be next. Okay, I'm all about seizing every opportunity, especially when it comes to broadening my horizons. So let me ask you this. Have you ever dreamt of effortlessly conversing in another language? Maybe it's for that upcoming international trip or simply to connect with family and friends in a new way. Well, I've been there. Let me tell you, the struggle was real. I actually discovered Rosetta Stone years ago when I was living in Germany, but it's the ultimate language learning tool that completely changed the game for me. So Rosetta Stone isn't just any language program. It's a trusted expert with over 30 years of experience and millions of users worldwide. Now with 25 languages to choose from, including Spanish, French, Italian, and more, it's like having a personal language coach right at your fingertips. And their method, it's all about immersion. So no more tedious translations. Instead, you're immersed in the language, learning to speak, listen, and even think in that new tongue. Plus with features like true accent speech recognition, it's like having a personal trainer for your accent. And talk about convenience, okay? You can access Rosetta Stone on your desktop or on their app with the options to download lessons for offline learning. And here's the kicker. They're offering Off the Vine listeners their lifetime membership with unlimited access to all 25 languages for 50% off. That's right, lifetime access for half the price. Literally an absolute steal. So what are you waiting for? Don't put off learning that language. There's no better time than right now to get started. Visit rosettastone.com slash vine. That's 50% off unlimited access to 25 language courses for the rest of your life. Redeem your 50% off at rosettastone.com slash vine today. Okay, we all know how I feel about comfort, especially when it comes to undergarments. Bras used to be the first thing I'd shed the moment I walked through the door, but then I discovered Skims. And you've heard me rave about their bras before, but let me just tell you again, their bras are a game changer. From the amazing shape and support to the surprising comfort, Skims bras have me absolutely hooked. Even the underwire bras, you guys, are now a breeze to wear all day long. I have their Fits Everybody t-shirt bra, and it's become my daily essential. The adjustable straps and the Fits Everybody material make it the most comfortable t-shirt shirt bra I've ever owned in my whole life. And then there's the no-show balconette bra. I swear it's the sexiest yet most comfortable bra in my collection, you know, for the nights that I want to step up my game for who, myself? I don't know, maybe. It enhances my natural shape, provides support, and stays invisible under any outfit. Trust me, you will not be disappointed. Shop Skims bras at skims.com, now available in 62 sizes, 30A through 46H. And if you haven't yet, be sure to let them know I sent you, okay? So after you place your order, select podcast in the survey, and then select off the vine in the drop down menu that follows. I, I love following you on social media for many reasons. You're you're one of the real ones, but I love that you are open about it and show photos that I'm sure it's therapeutic for you. Well, maybe I, I'm not going to speak for you, but yeah. therapeutic for you to share and either 
have people be like, wow, thank you for this. I went to get checked or I'm going to go get checked because of this or people that have maybe been through what you have and reach out, you know, and you find a little community and you've probably found so much strength through that. Yeah. I mean, the support has been amazing. And I think, you know, with what, what I do like on my podcast or what I did when I was on Real Housewives of Beverly Hills or any of the things I've done in my past, I'm like, there has to be a reason that I was the one that this happened to. Like one, it's because I am able to share my journey and other people will get checked. I mean, thousands and thousands of messages. Wow. I never thought I needed to get checked. I'm going to go get checked. But also I'm like, this is my little piece of like all the shit that I've done wrong. This is my way to give back. And I don't know if that's just like justification, but I'm like, it makes me feel better. Like I'm able to say, okay, go do this. And and somebody will change the outcome of their life because of it. Yes. Oh my gosh. That's, I mean, it's, it really is all about perspective, but it's, it's, that's an interesting way to think like, <laughs> this is just my way of giving back now is having to go through this. I hate <laughs> that you have to feel that way, but I hear what you're saying. And uh, we were talking about strength and speaking of strength, I wanted to talk not too much about housewives because we chatted about that the last time, but you're no longer on the show. And I just wanted to ask what the transition was like from being on the show and doing that so often to then not being on the show Were you sad? Do you miss it? Would you ever go back? I mean, I think originally it was a lot that went on in 2020 because I was pregnant, did the reunion, had a baby, the baby, my baby dove had to have neurosurgery. Then the pandemic happened. Like it was so much that went on. I got fired and I felt there was like a grieving process. Totally. But I think the world was also grieving. So I don't know how much of it I tie to watching my friends film and me not versus me also just being, I don't know if jealous is the right word, but I wish I could go out and do those things right yeah. now where we're all, you know, cause they were all taking their COVID tests, going to do stuff. We're seeing little pictures while we're all in our homes wearing gloves to go to the grocery yeah. store and washing our fruit with like sprays. Mm-hmm. Like it was yeah. a really weird time in general, but also, I mean, if I'm being completely honest, there's a part of you that feels like you're not enough when you lose a job, when you're like, oh my God, yes. wow, I, I'm not good enough or I wasn't funny enough or I wasn't rich enough or I wasn't strong enough or I wasn't you know, drama and like you find, and then the social media will fill in the gaps. <laughs> Anything that you think you you're okay at, they'll oh, tell you right away. You're actually so not. Different. Yes. That was, <laughs> I mean, even just hosting two seasons of the bachelor bachelorette and then them t- calling and saying like, you know, we're going to go a different direction. I was like, okay, somehow I blew it. It was just like a terrible reaction from audience. I pr- I probably made their ratings go down. I was probably terrible. People didn't like me. And yeah, they filled in all the gaps for me on that. And, yeah. and I think that was something that actually really saved me during COVID was being able to go on Dancing with the Stars and have this everyday thing that kind of, you know, I didn't really- Accountability. Feel it. Yeah. Yeah, it was accountability, which has obviously probably been one of your words in the past years. Yeah. That really helped me. So I can't imagine not having something and then seeing all your friends do something that you've been a part of for so long. Yeah. And so, I mean, there was, it was tough, but then, you know, right about a, I would probably say about a year after, or maybe it was less, I can't even, because time, as you know, it moves at like such a fast pace and I never believed my parents, but it, it really did. Yes. I Heart reached out to me and I had had a health and wellness podcast because I wasn't allowed to talk about housewives when I was employed on housewives. So I was right. like, you know, I had that for a couple of years and they called me right after and they were like, will you do a housewife podcast where we recap the franchises? I'm like, one, I don't watch all the franchises and two, no, I'm done. I was fired. I'm moving on, blah, blah, yeah. blah. And they like gave me a couple months and then they called back and they're like, no, like we we really think you could make really good money doing this. There's, you know, we want you to do like a, a recap of every episode. We'll have multiple episodes a week. This is a big opportunity for you and for financially. And also it's going to give you that, that spark and it's going to help you with your ultimate goal, which is being some sort of a host. And I said, fine, but I'm only doing it if I can pick a co-host and I get to like, I, I want a co-host. I don't want to do it by myself. Yeah. And they were like, okay, who do you want? And Tamara Judge had just gotten fired too. And I was like, right. I want Tamara Judge. And they were like, well, she's not going to say yes. And I was like, 
the hell she was like I can be very convincing so I was like well let me call her first and I called her and she had that same little chip on her shoulder that I had about being fired and like all those things and I was like let's go and like crush this let's go and be our hot mess express selves and say all the things that we want to say and feel and not have to be a part of it we're watching a television we're getting paid to watch television yeah and she was like all right and then we hit the ground running and it was like number one every single it was like pop 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 and we're like okay i saw it was it it does so well and it's so i i really wish that i watched housewives just so i could like come on and talk about it because (laughs) i tried to get you to cover for her this week because she's out of town and they're like she doesn't watch I wanted to lie so badly and be like, yep, I watch, I'll be there. And then I was like, I can't do it. I can't can't lie. Otherwise I would be there. But I mean, I just love it. It's perfect. You guys are so like funny on social media too. And I wanted to know if you've always been a kind of unapologetic person. Like, is that always just, is that in your DNA? Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like I've always been that way. And that's why watching back when I was on Housewives was so hard because I wasn't myself a hundred percent. Like I felt a different type of way that now that I have the podcast, I'm like, wow, if I were ever to be on another show or do something else or go back to that, whatever it may be, I'm back to feeling that confidence that I once yeah. had, like, and something that I, you know, I've shared on, on my podcast, but not that much. But when I started housewives, my husband and I were not in a good place and yeah. I was definitely like just trying to get through. And I think when you look back and think that you're like, oh, wow, that makes sense. Because when you're just trying to put one foot in front of the other, you're not your unapologetic self. You're really just back to like, let's figure this out day by day. And so, yeah, I mean, there's definitely, I've always been that way and I maybe lost myself for a little bit, but yeah, yeah. I mean, I was kind of raised to be this way. Well, I mean, you grew up with a very famous dad, obviously John Mellencamp. I, okay. You've been quoted saying, is it Nepo baby? Is that what it is called? Nepo baby. Yes. Nepo baby. And the implication is that because their parents had connections in an industry, the child is able to use those connections to build a career in that industry. Now, I don't want to speak for you, but you've said that having a celebrity parent kind of pushed yourself even harder to add another level and added another level of pressure that you put on yourself. So talk to me about that because I can totally see where I obviously did not have famous parents. What was that pressure like? Was it, did you feel like you needed to make him proud? Was there a certain standard put on you? Like, if you think I have an unapologetic personality, imagine me times like a hundred. That is my father. (laughs) And my mom is also like, kind of like a free bird. She says whatever she, you know, like both of them have the ability, like the gift of like gab and just saying what's from the heart. That being said, I felt like everything was a non-negotiable. So I had to show up and I had to show up in this way or else don't show up at all. And if you're not giving 110%, you're not giving enough. And like, there was always like, I would, and I don't even know necessarily if it was him doing that or that's just my personality type where I'm, you know, because some of my siblings don't feel that way. So I'm sure it's a combination. Yeah, but I think, you know, when it comes to Nepo Baby, people are like, oh, this or that. I'm like, do, do, did it open doors for me that wouldn't have been opened? Yes. Do I think I had to work hard because of it? Yes, because I wanted to prove myself not only to him, but to anybody else. Right. I've had to work my ass off. I didn't, I, you know, everyone's like, oh, you came to LA and you had all this money. And I'm like, no, I, I didn't. My parents were like, you can have your car that you got when you turned 16, but like you can get it out there and move in. Like I lived in a studio apartment in bunk beds with my first roommate. Like it's, you know, I had two jobs. I, it I wasn't- love that though. But that's, I mean, that's just your work ethic at the end of the day too, because I was talking about this with Brandy Cyrus. She's like, that's probably the biggest misconception about me is that money's just handed to me. I'm just a Cyrus. I like don't have to work for it. And she's like, I've moved mountains to get to where I'm at in the, you know, this male dominated industry of DJs. And like, you know, she's worked so hard and that's kind of, I'm I'm guessing a misconception that, you know, people in your world and those 
Nepo babies have had, which is so frustrating because it takes away the credibility from all the hard work that you do and who you are as a person, because a lot of people wouldn't survive in LA in a studio apartment with bunk beds and getting to where you got <laughs> in your life too, you know? And I wanted to know if there's any like unique opportunities or experiences or stories that you remember with kind of that comes with being part of a famous family. I mean, I remember, I mean, my most, <laughs> I, I, my dad was on tour with Bob Dylan. And whenever my dad's on tour, my siblings and I, or my husband or my kids or whoever goes, we always sit on these speaker boxes on the side because we don't get tickets because it's, it's the point. So we sit on the side. So I didn't know the order of go. And so like, I just went and sat on the speakers that we sit on and all of a sudden I'm getting moved and I'm like, what, what happened? And they're like, Oh, Teddy, you got to come down. And I'm like, Okay, so I come down and they're like, Bob Dylan's going on next. And I was like, oh. And they were like, yeah, when he's performing, he doesn't like to make eye contact. And you're at his eye level. <laughs> no way. <laughs> and that actually makes sense. It may like catch you off guard because normally you're looking down at everybody on stage. And all of a sudden, if you looked up and you were directly making eye contact with somebody, it could be distracting. But I was like, and then it got more awkward than that because then we all do the introduction afterwards. I didn't know that he was a fist pumper. So he put his like hand out to fist oh, no. pump me to say hi. And I shook his like clothes. I hate it. I hate it. <laughs> and then I was like, I just looked at my dad and I was like, dad, I've, I've messed up all the things with Bob Dylan. I haven't done one cool thing with Bob Dylan. I'm most awkward human alive. Like oh, first I tried to make, I force him to make eye contact with me. Then I shook his paw. Like it's just getting worse and worse. <laughs> Wait, that's so funny because anytime somebody does that to me and I do it, I just, uh, they'll do this and I'll go to shake and then I go, oh, gear shift. And I'll go like, <laughs> I like to pretend I've like shit. And I, I just make it more weird. And then I just walk away. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so that happened. Also, the year that I got in so much trouble for being late, Madonna and Sean Penn were at my house. So it's like those no. types of things you can't. Yes. Wait, like, that's you have to imagine, birthday. like, 13 year old me sitting at the table, and my dad's like, You're not having a birthday party tomorrow. You were two hours late. I told you to ride your bike home by this time, blah, blah, blah. And I'm sitting there with Madonna and Sean Penn, like, <laughs> my gosh that is crazy have you written a book no i can't no oh i would read that in a second i mean i feel like you have so many <laughs> good stories like just like from growing up and life on tv into like what i don't know i just feel like your book would if you ever want to keep over maybe, maybe you can help me one day i'll be your ghost writer no that would be really bad <laughs> um <laughs> That would be really bad. Wait, you were talking about making eye contact and it reminded me of, do you know who Dermot Kennedy is? Yes. I went to one of his, con well, I've been to like six of his concerts. I'm like a super fan, but I was row like two for one of his concerts. And I swear we made eye contact for like <laughs> a solid 10 seconds. And I was like, is you had eye aware? sex. We had <laughs> eye sex. And, and I swear. And I was like, uh, uh, does he do this with like other people? And then my girlfriend after the concert, she goes, did you see him, him making eye contact with me uh, during that song? And I was like, what? what? Is he looking at me or you? And I like thought we had a moment, but that's, it's so funny because I do feel like he was making eye contact. So interesting. So um, I think every me. performer must be different, but yeah. I, I mean, I don't know. I've never really performed on stage singing. And so I, I wouldn't necessarily know and having to play an instrument and all the things. I don't know some things because I don't watch Real Housewives and I, but, but in my notes I had, and again, I know you're an open book, but you don't have to say anything, but your dad started dating your best friend. Is he still with her? No, they're not still together. Oh, okay. Oh I, was, I just read these notes and I was like, what? I didn't know that. Oh, he loves that I have, he's like, Teddy, can you shut up? Like, what are you, why are you always sharing everything? And I'm like, I didn't do it. Listen, you know, but no, they're no longer together. But yeah, that was... Well, there's just, you know, it's so, there's, there's so many pros and cons to so many different family dynamics and like, you know, having a celebrity dad is going to come with some weird experiences, I feel like. And that's just, you know, and I think that the, the interesting part is like, I've now become immune to it. It like, doesn't even weird me out. Like if somebody is like, oh, your dad's hot or this or whatever. And the, the hard part about the Nepo baby term is like, you're supposed to 
one, you're supposed to show that you you do it on your own, but then you don't want to shade your parent because you're actually proud right. that they are your parent because they've worked really hard themselves. So it's like puts you in this weird dynamic where I'm like, of course, I'm proud of my dad. He has, you know, done all of these things. I don't want to ride his coattails, but I also right. don't want to pretend he doesn't exist as a human yes. being in my life. And he really is one of my best friends. And mm -hmm. if I need advice about anything, he's the one I call and vice versa. And, you know, including his dating life. I'm like, I can't. Yes. <laughs> That's so, I, mean, I look, if I was going to um, call anyone for life advice, it would be someone who's lived life. You know, I feel like your dad <laughs> probably lived so many different lives and gone through so many different experiences. So I love that he's one of your best friends. That's my dad's one of mine too. It's so sweet. Oh, I love that. So moving into our last thing I've got, I wanted to play two truths and a lie. So <laughs> I, I always love this game when I listen to other podcasts, I love when they do stuff like this. And so I want you to share two truths and one lie and I'll guess which one is the lie. And then you do the same for me. Okay. Is this a PG podcast or can I say anything? You can, rated R is better. Okay. All right. <clears throat> I once put a popsicle in my vagina. <laughs> One of my best selling items on LTK is a cock ring okay. and I'm allergic to mango. Okay. I think you're allergic to mango and you put a popsicle up your vagina. Nope. Hold on. Hold on. You think, you think I put a popsicle in my vagina? I mean, kids get curious at a certain age. No, but one of the housewives did. That's why it became one. That's why it was one of my lies. I'm allergic to mangoes and my best selling item on LTK is a cock ring. Is it really? I don't know if I've made the most money from it, but it's the most clicks and purchases. But the item is only $8.99. They're disposable from Amazon. But every time I talk about it or post about it, it's like thousands and thousands are purchased. So you it's also incredible. should go to, this is actually a pretty funny story about the cock ring. I always oh. talk about it because it will change your life. And I was talking about it at this like formal work event. And I was just like, oh, you know, these are the best. And one of the wives purchased it, but she had been drinking. And so then the next, like two weeks later, she's like, oh my gosh, I just got home from Christmas vacation. And I opened this big box from Amazon and like a hundred cock rings popped out. And I was with my kids. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> she's like, I forgot we ordered them in the bathroom. I was like, no, we did. We did. That's funny because something similar like that just happened to me where I went to my old house that I'm getting rid of a bunch of stuff so I can sell it. And this guy was in there helping me go through stuff to the, either put in the trash bin or recycle or give to charity. And I'm going through all this stuff and like a company must have sent me um, like these sex toys that I never opened. And I opened one cupboard in my podcast room and it was all <laughs> sex toys. And it was like this grown ass man. And I was like, Cool, cool, cool. Uh, just throw <laughs> You're like, well, let's def let, let's keep these. <laughs> <laughs> this is definitely a keep. Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh, he was like this old Southern man too. It was so humiliating. So oh, I maybe he didn't that. know. Maybe he didn't know. Oh, he knew. I made it he obvious knew. and weird. I, that's just what I. <laughs> you get awkward. I make it more awkward. It's like that's my humor to make things more weird than they have to be. And so I was like, oh. Yeah, these are dusty. Uh, oh, God. No, these are yes. dusty. Gross. I'm really glad you brought that up because that reminded me of that story. It literally just happened yesterday. So it's a funny story. <laughs> okay, I'll give you mine. I attended a Hollywood party and ended up hooking up with Leonardo DiCaprio. Okay. I've never watched an episode of Sex in the City. And I once accidentally bumped into Ryan Reynolds at a hardware store. I think... You've never watched Sex in the City. Okay. Am I right? Yeah. <laughs> You've but made wait, there's two. To you have to put out the lie. Hold on. Oh, shit. Sorry. I got all excited yeah. that you made out with Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> Damn it. You, dang it. You ran into Ryan Reynolds in the hardware store. I know. I wish Why did you get me all that? excited? I know. I, w I wish I've hooked up with Leonardo DiCaprio, but no, I, I have not. Uh, but yeah, what I was walking out of, I was, it was my 
fourth birthday or 23rd birthday, I had gotten locked out of my apartment because I partied so hard the night before and lost my keys. So I was in Sounds like right. my girlfriend's oversized pajamas walking down the street in Vancouver, trying to go to like a store to get an outfit. And I walked out and he was walking out of this hardware store and we like ran into each other and I was like, oh, sorry. And then I looked up and I was like, oh, Ryan Reynolds. And I said that out loud, oh, Ryan Reynolds. And then I just kept walking. <laughs> Did you have eye sex though? Yeah, we sure did. 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Just the tip of the eyes. Yeah, it still counts. <laughs> oh God, I love it. Um, oh my oh, God, it's so good. You're amazing. I love talking to you. I've missed you. Um, next time I'm out in LA, I'm like, I should just watch some of the episodes so I can come hang out with you guys on the podcast. <laughs> yes, just come or we, we, we'll bring you on just as a guest to talk about anything. At this point, it, we can go off. We can go off script. Yeah, I can hang. I too am a fellow open book, unapologetic lady over here. So <laughs> anytime. I love it. And congratulations on your tour. Thank you so much. Um, tell everybody where they can find your stuff. Yeah. You can find me on Instagram at Teddy Mellencamp or my business stuff is all in by teddy.com and make sure that you're listening to two T's in a pod and popping off, um, wherever you listen to podcasts. Amazing. Thank you. And thanks for sharing everything on social media and with us today. And, uh, I'll talk to you soon. I'm Caitlin Bristow. I'll see you next Tuesday. You're next.